Don't go anywhere or you'll be next. This time on Graveyard Cars, the A100 Little Dead Wagon is on the final lap to SEMA. After a custom paint job, the ghouls converge on this once humble Dodge to install the massive drivetrain. But when the engine doesn't fit, will the ghouls quit? What are you guys cutting now? There's no reason to cut anything because you mocked it up already. Your beautiful paint job. In Springfield, Oregon, Mark Warman, together with his skilled ghouls, it has been established that the unburied dead are coming back to life. Bring classic Mopar muscle cars back from the dead to look like they did the moment they left the factory floor. Because of the obvious threat, this station will remain on the air day and night. My name is Brenda Kellison. I'm a pinstriper. Mark gave me the opportunity to letter the little dead wagon, um, his version of the little red wagon, and so I couldn't pass it up. Instead of just freehanding, I'll use actually a pattern and I'll use a pounce wheel. Tape it up on the vehicle um, after I've made my pattern and take my pounce pad and pounce it out. And what it does is when you pull the paper off, it leaves a trace of powder so you have an outline. I use fine line tape sometimes as a guide. Not every surface that you paint on, you can actually wipe off. So best thing is, is don't make a mistake. I use one shot lettering enamel. The car's gotta be clean and free of any like grease, debris, anything like that. Because if I go to paint on something that's got like um, polishing compounds or waxing or anything like that, uh, make it fish eye and cause problems. In this application, I'm, I'm gonna just go at it. Um, there's not gonna be a lot of overlapping. There's gonna be a lot of outlining, so I can just wet on wet paint is what it's called. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. We got lots to do. Yes, we do. Now, what are we going to be working on to get ready for SEMA this year? Tell everybody what we're going to be doing. Well, I got to get out of bed first. Well, you're already out of bed. You're oh, I'm out of bed. I'm here? I'm here already? Yeah. Uh, for SEMA? Yeah, we're getting a rig ready to go to SEMA. Ah, I bet it's a hot rig. Powerful. Hot one. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay, so we got a lot to do on the Dodge A100. Oh, that one, that's a hot rig, isn't it? What kind of pieces do we still have to put on that? We got the windshields. Two still. of them. Got a lot of them, got two windshields, yeah. It's a split windshield. And Very back cool glass. Design. Back glass. Doors gotta be built out. Nice. We have all of the wiring. We still need to wire up the, whew, the Ooh. fuel pump, the MSD. Ooh. The dash needs to be wired, the lights need to be wired. All that. Now, before we can do all that, uh -huh. We have a 923 horsepower on pump gas, Ray Barton, Mopar Performance 426 Hemi that just came in. And our monster 727 Torque Flight is here. So before we can do any of that, we've got to get a drivetrain put in this thing. Uh huh. You ready? Yeah. Uh -huh. Will we make SEMA? Yep. Are you excited? I promise. Are you planning on going? I'm excited. Now we're on to another question now. Uh, am I planning on going? Yes. That well, was... I don't know if my ride's going to be here or not. Who's your ride? Well, I don't know. I never know. 
Just what? whenever they show up. Whenever they show up. I don't know who's going to be picking me up. Who is they? Well, whoever. Whoever's going to be picking me up. I never know. I get no details. <sighs> what? Sure is a nice day, isn't it? It's a beautiful day out. It's going to be a busy week. <laughs> yeah. So this is getting to be crunch time. Uh, Doug and I are working on getting the engine mounts in position. I've already pre-mocked all this stuff up, so now it's just a matter of putting it on the engine and getting it ready to go in the A100. Suspension, same thing. We've had it together once, but we had to blow it apart, have all the chrome work done, so we've got to put it all back together again. Transmission, got to get it married to the engine and ready to go in. This is the drivetrain. The only thing that's easier about this one, there's no drive shaft. The output shaft of the transmission bolts to the rear end input shaft, or yoke, if you will. So with all of the things bolted on it, on our drivetrain, there's only one thing left to do. That is to install this bad boy, all right? Bad boy, bad boy, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when I come for you? Bad boy. What's the question again? Uh, bad boy installed in the, in the truck, yeah. It, that's, that's what's left, so. Yeah. Gotta learn the rest of those lyrics too someday. Because I'm pretty sure it's not chicka 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 You know, and I know that doesn't even make sense. Okay, are you guys where it needs to be? towards the passenger side. How much room you got over there, side to side? We're gonna go your way, Doug. Okay, let me look here. Kinda need to get an idea where we're at here. Cause that, that was gonna set the center. We may have to take those spacers off. I don't know yet. Go ahead and try to mock it in there and let's see what it looks like. Don't hit your head, Doug. Poor guy. God, that's gnarly. Let's go to the right one more inch. So, we need to go down five inches. Awesome. Okay. Nineteen seventy one, no question, is the most collectible of all the Barracuda Cuda cars in the world. The unique four headlight, cheese grater style grill on the front of it, the tail lights. There's a lot of things that make this car extremely sexy. One of them, of course, is the louvered fenders. Now, when it comes to production figures, Doug knows all this stuff, right? Uh-huh. All right. If you had a 1971 Cuda 446 barrel four-speed, such as our Phantom Cuda from a couple of seasons ago, the one that started the whole show, they made a total of 108. If you had a 446 barrel automatic, like this car right here, a real V-code. They made 129 of those. Now, what's interesting about this particular car is under the hood, even though this is a real V-code, 129, 446 barrel automatics, it's actually got a 426 semi setting in it, which you can tell by the way the car looks, it was designed to go racing at some point. If you had a real 71 Cuda with a 426 Hemi and an automatic transmission, you would have one of 48 ever built. If you had one with a four-speed, you'd have one of 59 ever built. So this being one of only 129 446 barrel automatics, right? Right. Makes this the Graveyard Cars <clears throat> Corpse of the Week. What's this car? It's a blue 71 Cuda. 
What are we calling it? <laughs> it's a race car. Yeah. It's a Plymouth. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it is. I got that part. <laughs> So we are getting ready to install the drivetrain, the engine and transmission as a unit into our Dodge A100. It's not just a matter of dropping it in there like it is on some cars or just dropping the car down around it like we do on the other cars. Come on in, Will. But I already pre-fit everything so I don't anticipate any problems. Should go together like it's supposed to. Again, just caution. Will's gonna run the forklift. He's hopefully gonna exercise caution. And the rest of us will work on getting it lined up and in place. Once that's done, we can bolt it in, raise it up and button everything up on the bottom side. Mark, it's not going to fit. You did not mock everything up appropriately, therefore the engine and the transmission's not gonna go in. I've looked at this thing pretty closely and what it seems like to me, and I did pre-fit it, so don't try to, I know when I pre-fit something, it works. What I didn't take into consideration was how close the tolerances were and how little bit of movement that we have, so it looks like we'll have to take the transmission away from the engine and do them individually as components, but that's okay. Best laid plans of mice and men. I've been excited for this moment. Um, it is gonna be a setback, but he didn't mock anything up. He took a Hemi, took the, just the bare bones of it, just the block, put it in there. He didn't account for anything else. You know, the blower, carburetors, all that. None of that's been accounted for. So I have literally been waiting for this moment to show that he really doesn't know how to mock up. Shift it to your left one inch, Will. Right there, perfect. Good. If you scratch the truck, we start back over, all right? I know this gives Will a thrill that, that things aren't just falling together, but nobody said, I don't remember ever saying things will just fall together. I've looked at this thing pretty closely and what it seems like to me, and I did pre-fit it, so don't try to, I know when I pre-fit something, it works. There, Why right. did I put my, no. No, nope, oh, that's too yeah. far. What? Hey, Jesse. And now it's too far. What do you, can you back up like one inch? Try half an inch, maybe you'll land at an inch. <laughs> Perfect, right there. Wow, that's good. That's good. Now, can we go down at all? We're nice and loose here, loosey-goosey. Yeah. Stop. I think we're wedged. Stop. We're, on the, we're on the deck. Okay. So, uh, again, I told Mark to get all these measurements. He clearly did not. Okay. Inches. Well, the good news is we're under, we're under here now. Yeah. So, Will, can you drop it just a little bit? Yes. Like one inch? We need a jack under it, then okay. we can start moving. Doug, go ahead, grab us a jack. I don't care what Will says, okay? Will's a, Will's a future good old boy. Him and Royal are gonna be the tag team brothers out there at the school district changing locks, all right? I, I pre-fit it, I pre-measured it. Everything was intentional. This is also the first Dodge A100 with a thousand horsepower Hemi in it that does wheelies that I can recall putting together. There you go. There we go. So I'm, cl I'm clear of the deck. Okay, so it just needs to come forward. Yeah, can you bring it forward? Go ahead and drive forward six inches. Well, no, he's gonna hit with the, the rope. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So now we're now we're out of room because of this band. God, I've got a bad feeling about this. Well, we'll need to, we have to undo these chains back here in order to get this off. Because we're looped in right here. Well, no, we're I think we'll through. be able to come. This is stuff that needs to be accounted for. Uh, Mark's not Jesse James, he's, he's not even a, a car builder. I mean, he's just a car overseer. I mean, look, here's the deal. You notch the panel. <laughs> we have to, there isn't a choice. What, what are you guys cutting now? There's no reason to cut anything because you've mocked it up already. Your beautiful paint job. I am super happy. I saw this moment coming. I'm not upset about it. It is what it is. They can go in there and make their extra cuts, make the hole bigger, whatever they have to do, but that's fine. Just proves that I was right and Mark was wrong. So that's eight inches, so I need to go. Screw Goldilocks. He can pick all the stuff he wants out of me, all right? He can pass all the judgment. But I believe it was a little carpenter from the little town of Nazareth who once said, let he among you without sin cast the first stone. Okay, go ahead and take the tape measure out. I need a straight edge of some kind to make a mark across there. This was actually done on the weekend by Mark himself. This is 100% on Mark. Okay. 
Will it slide forward? Could we roll it forward? Now this is exactly what happens when you lay all the plans out, you do your job, you think it out, you fit it, you cut it, you measure it, you make sure it's supposed to do exactly what it did. That is the result. That right there is the result of doing it right the first time. <laughs> The thing about a car guy is, especially somebody that's good in their field, is they have the ability to think outside the box. I'm an OE guy. I restore cars to OE condition, and I'm recognized for it. Now, custom world, I haven't done a whole lot of it, but this is a good example of being able to think outside the box, be able to adapt and overcome. Because at the end, I think when all the smoke clears and everybody's done chanting my name, you know, there's like one brand advocate for Mopar. So. The 1971 Plymouth Cuda was one of the most collectible cars in the history of all muscle cars. This car is a 446 barrel with an automatic transmission. How many of those cars were built from the factory? 59. 59, yeah, if it was a Hemi. Is it 108, 129, or 149? If you think you know the answer, stay tuned after the break. I will give it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Right? Uh-huh. All right, ghouls, welcome back. How did you do? Dougie got traded out for a new model from Baldar, they switched him out. So this guy may know a little bit more than the guy that was here a little bit ago for the break. Had to hey. hide to the people at home. So what did you say? How many 1971 Cuda 446 barrel automatics were built if you said? 129. You would be exactly right. Yeah, I like this new model. <laughs> you would be exactly correct. If you said 108, that's how many four-speed versions, like our Phantom Cuda, were built, and the other number just doesn't exist. So now you know, right? Right. Know what? Why? No, how many cars were built? How many 71 Cuda 446 barrel automatics? 129. How many four speed versions? 108. God. I missed 59. 59. <laughs> <laughs> you had it right. So with a lot of the big stuff out of the way on the A100, we're really moving close towards the finish line. Just, just lots of little, the minutiae stuff now. The stuff that may not show anywhere else, but might show in how the car runs, how it drives. And we don't want anybody picking something apart because it wasn't done right. The outside mirrors on the A100 are just adorable. We sent them up to Portland, had them chrome. They came back beautiful. They're just unique because how high they stand. No muscle car that we have has anything like that. No, no van of today has anything like that. So I would have a real strong feeling those are unique to that A100 van and truck back in the day. Because it's called the Little Dead Wagon and it has a bit of a macabre theme to it. I have a little leeway with my creativity. So the lock buttons, they're skulls. I just bought them on eBay. They're a little chrome screw on. They actually screw onto the post where your normal lock knob would, but they're little skulls. Gonna be point, pointing straight forward. It kind of, it, it is the little version of what we did underneath when it came to cobwebs and some of the design that we did. Uh, I do try to throw a little bit of that macabre feel into the whole truck, and I think people will appreciate that. So if you're installing the outside door handles, the one thing you want to make sure is that there's an adjustment on the thumb push. You want to make sure that when you push that little thumb knob in, it doesn't immediately disengage the latch. You don't want to just touch it and have it open the door, right? You want to have it have a nice full motion to it. So there's just a minor adjustment there. Once that's done, you can bolt it on. We had no problems with it. It bolted on, he was able to connect the relay rod to the latch and it worked perfectly. As far as the inside door handles, that's just a matter of putting it on the actual mechanism in the correct clocking. Because you could put it anywhere you want. You could take that thing, rotate it, flip it, you just want it in an ergonomic way so when you get, if you're sitting in the truck, you can make a pull like this right here and it would open the door. Piece of cake to go on there. These were originals, by the way. I did not have them re-chromed. And if you look at them closely, they're almost perfect.
These doors have an amazing shape to them. If you watch them, they, there's a lot of motion going on there. They're not just like a typical door. If you take a Dodge Challenger or Cuda, any of the cars that we work on, that door weather strip, at the back of the door, it starts right about the belt height, goes straight down, straight across the bottom, and reasonably straight up the front. This encircles the entire door, and it goes on the door itself. So these have to be molded, has to fit exactly where it's supposed to from the factory because there's a relief in the body for it and they go exactly where they're supposed to go. So if you have it off, you try to close the door, it's gonna spring back out at you. So the doors are all assembled. We got the locks, the handles, we got the latch assemblies in, the new weather strips. With all that done, that really allows us to button up a good majority of that cab. It's 1979. Your daddy just gave you a Plymouth Barracuda Grand Coupe. He also gave you a full tank of gas. You've been out hot rodding around because you got to do that while I was working. You got in trouble with the police. They're in behind you. They're chasing you on I-5. Which one does Dougie want of these two police cars chasing him down the freeway? Is it the 1976 Dodge with a 440 police interceptor in it or the 1978 Dodge with a 318 in it? This one probably gets about the same mileage your little car got. This one probably gets one or two miles to the gallon, but gets there fast. Which one would you choose? It's not about you. It's about you. Go to graveyardcars.com and vote. You can go to Facebook and Twitter and vote as well. Tell us which one of those cars you'd want to see in your rear view mirror on a Saturday night at a buck 20 on the highway. You already know the answer because I saw it happen in real time. I'll tell you about that. We will reveal the answer live on Facebook next Tuesday. Remember, Tuesday's our new date for Graveyard Cars. We'll see you then. Yeah. See you then. You always I'll see you up. then. Okay, just keep screaming at Rain Man. That's fine. So far, the ghouls knocked out the big ticket items on the little dead wagon, installing the drivetrain, the monster transmission, and the 923 horsepower Ray Barton Racing Supercharged Hemi. That is the result. That right there is the result of doing it right the first time. Still to come, the ghouls move on to finish some of the details of the A100's assembly with the goal of firing up the Mopar Performance Hemi as long as nothing goes wrong. Jesus! Oh. So last time we were talking about the E-body dash trim bezels, the one that surrounds the heater control or one that surrounds the radio itself. I wanted to talk about the outer bezels. These are the lower dash trim pieces. This is the part that if you were in an accident and sliding forward, your knee would hit this piece right here. So this is the piece that is the final finish panel that you see when it's mounted into the car. Now remember from last time, your 70 to 74 E-bodies, these are all the same except for the 70 Challenger. In this particular case, the 70 Challenger, the leading edge of it comes to a point. This is a 1970 Challenger only. The 70 to 74 Cuda and 71 to 74 Challenger right here, you see has a style line in it. While this component will screw into the same location this one will, it won't line up with the actual dash pad itself. So if you're doing a 1970 Dodge Challenger, you're restoring it, you're not gonna wanna grab the one with the style line in it, you're gonna wanna grab the one that actually has the point right here. For the most part, they're shaped almost identically. If you look at the back side, you can tell they're almost identical all the way through. It isn't until you turn it over that you see you have the point here for the Challenger and the style line here for the 70 to 74 Cuda and 71 to 74 Challenger. Now this is the right hand piece. It has a lot more movement. First of all, see how they just lay together. I better put the two together that match right there. That's because this surrounds the side of the dash has one set screw in it. But when you put these two together, they're gonna go like that. And the area that I'm standing in 
is where you're gonna have a steering column down below it, above it, an instrument cluster, the full instrumentation and the switch panel, including the radio. So these are the 1970 Challenger only dash trim, and this is the 1971 to 74 Challenger and 70 to 74 Barracuda and Cuda. That's all I got. really getting down to the final crunch time on the A100. The AM radio in this little truck is just, it's like the mirrors, I just love it. It's so cute, it's just a little tiny little thing. But there's a little gear mechanism in there that it has these little tiny gears that run when you run the little knob from side to side and it's just, it's just adorable. There's no real problem connecting it all up because it's all plug and play stuff. So we're just gonna get the radio installed in it. But I did not wanna modify the appearance of that dash. So that is the stock original, not chromed AM radio. Yeah, when you're talking about the dash assembly uh, of a Dodge A100, it isn't like our cars. That you can take the five screws across the front and the two 716 bolts on the side and lift the, the dash mechanism out, the whole dash assembly. This particular case, this is a true unibody. The frame rails are built into it like a unibody would have, but everything in it, the framework for the instrument panel and for the radio, the things that will bolt into it that'll make it a street functionable unit, they're actually welded into the body itself. So I can't take those out and put them in sandblaster and blast them all up and make them pretty. Will had to do all that stuff in place. Doug and I have about the same amount of experience when it comes to automotive wiring, electrical wiring, which is plug and play. All these cars that you look at, if you go around and look at the back side of one of these dashes, everything plugs in. They change the plug in so they can only go one way. For the most part, it's hard to make a mistake. It's the same thing applies here, except that they're not as well labeled. So you just wanna make sure that the wires going to the amp gauge are the correct side so it doesn't show discharge when it's charging, vice versa. You wanna make sure that the wires going to the other gauges are the ones that are going to the sending units. Just, it's real simple. I'm, I'm not trying to make it sound like it's a lot, but it's also something that if you just slap it together, none of your gauges are gonna work. Okay, folks, standing next to a real live 1971 CUDA 446 barrel automatic. How many were built? 129. 129, that's right. You know the answer, just shoot it right out oh there. Oh boy. True or false, 1971 Plymouth Barracuda was the only year that had a four headlight system. Did you not? What? I'm What's not wrong? asking. Stay tuned after the break and I'll give you the answer. That's why we're doing the true or false, so people can stay tuned after the break for the answer. You can't say the answer. Oh. Are you sure of that I answer? No. All right, welcome back, Ghouls. How did you do on that one? You had a little bit of help from Cousin Dougie. Oh, sorry. But was he right? The question was, did the 1971 Barracuda stand alone, Cuda and Barracuda, clarify that, stand alone as the only model year to have a four headlight system? Doug said. True. And if you agreed with Doug, well, normally I'd feel sorry for you. In this particular <laughs> case, you're exactly right. Four headlights, 71 Cuda. 1970 was a single, went to a four headlight in 71. 72, 73, also single headlight system. It was also the last year of a lot of really cool things. So 1971 was the pinnacle year, if I can use a word like that with you. Yeah. The pinnacle year for the Plymouth Barracuda. Now, are they trading you back out again? <laughs> I don't know. It's possible. So one of the things I'm trying to do with this truck is keep it very period correct. So you look at the decals on it, those are replicas of the decals that would have been from those sponsors back in the day. Not today's logo, but the logo in 1964 when the truck was built. The big footprint moon eyes gas pedal. I love it. I mean, you grew up, every, every kid, Joe Dirt had one. Remember Dirte, he put one in his charger. You suck, you do. 
I love those things. So we're installing one of those over the original gas pedal in the 64A100. I think it's just going to add a great look to it and throw it right back into that area. George, when you get your cutoff wheel set up, I just need to come across the top of that. Thing. In order to get the Moon Eyes gas pedal to fit correctly and not have a bunch hanging out, we did have to trim off the leading edge of the original replacement gas pedal that I bought for it. But otherwise, it's just a clamp on the back side of it, a couple of Phillips screws, sucks right into place and looks super cool. The accelerator pedal setup in the Dodge A100, it's different in some ways, but it's very similar in principle to just all the cars that we work on. You press the accelerator pedal, the accelerator cable pulls back at the carburetor, in this case dual carburetors, and, and makes some function. Yeah, I haven't had the luxury of seeing the original one or one of the original ones that Maverick used to run. I would imagine he used the same type of setup. I don't know why he would do anything differently. Mechanical linkage with rods, relay rods, that would put too much pressure on it to be able to step on the accelerator and have it actually work like it's supposed to. I think it'd be way too much weight to take it to move. Your leg would get sore. I would imagine the original one also used to throttle cable. So the Greenhorn, Justin, he worked at a place where they installed all of the sirens and emergency equipment in the police cars and the, and the emergency rescue vehicles. So he has a lot more experience. So what I'm doing is letting him connect all the ignition stuff. We put an MSD ignition in it. We want it to come on with the key. It has to have an override switch to shut it off. He has to wire in the fan, the electric fan for the motor. So this is exactly his cup of tea. And it feels good to me because as everybody knows, I'm colorblind and I'd have a heck of a time doing it. But he's doing a really good job. This uses an MSD ignition with it. It has an electric fuel pump that needs to be wired in. So each one of the components that need power to them and need to send signals to certain places have to be individually wired. And that's what Justin's doing. This is his cup of tea. He worked at a place where this is all they did all day long. So I have total confidence he'll do a great job. I also require that everything is very low profile. I don't want a big glob harness of stuff coming up. I want it to follow the outline of the engine opening, then go underneath the carpet very sleek and up to the back side of the dash. One of the biggest things that can happen in, in any automotive shop, if you connect a power to a direct ground, what's going to happen is it's going to short out. And it's not just, it's not going to explode or anything like in the movies. The wire inside of it is going to instantly start glowing, which is going to melt and burn and catch fire to the insulation on the outside of it. That's how engine fires start. That's how cars burn to the ground. All you need is an open flame on a car, and you've got yourself uh, an incendiary device. It's, it's always a touch and go, and when you do have everything wired, you don't just connect the battery cable to it and say, well, I hope everything works out. You take your time, you touch it, make sure there's no resistance on it, then do that. Then once you make the connection, you don't tighten it down because you may want to pull that cable back off. Just leave it loose and go through the systems check. So the headlight switch in these vehicles are, are really very much like all the cars we work on. You pull it to the first click, gives you park lamps, second click gives you headlights. To be able to move forward with getting the rest of the interior in the truck, we've got to be able to put the back window in. It's going to be up to our team to get it installed. It's not particularly difficult. It's a matter of making sure your glass is clean and ready to go in, which it was. We did not have a new gasket. All right, this is a pressure fit type of a gasket. So what happens is you put the gasket on the glass and then you put it up into place and you try to draw that gasket through onto the inside of the pinch weld for the back window opening. That's where the difficulty can come in. So with these back glasses, you don't have to urethane them in. They just really set into place and the molding holds it into place. So therefore we can just do it ourselves. 
So we had to use our original gasket on it. That means that it wasn't as supple as a new one would be. So when it came to corners, inside corners, like the four that I have, getting that molding to come in and press over the pinch weld like it's supposed to, being able to put enough pressure on the glass itself that it wouldn't break, that's the taxing part. So you have to preload it into place really well, hold it up in there, and then the guy on the inside, he begins with a pick, just drawing that around, drawing around. Now I know professional glass guys are gonna say, well, you should have took a rope or something, put it around the inside of it. But in this case, I just did it the way that I thought would work best. And ultimately we got it, but yeah, there's always a handful of problems with it. The main thing is, this late in the game, you don't want to bust the window if you're pressing the so Yeah, yeah. careful, still put enough pressure in to get that gap. So we're out of If you can just kind of work that baby, and help Mark push up. Okay, Mark. Huh? I think you got it. So the glass came out great. Um, everything went pretty well. Back glass is in, looks great. We had it tinted, so we can move on to the next step. I have no doubt that we won't have any water leaks, uh, so I think it was a success. The windshield installation, uh, way past my pay grade. That's very, very precise work when it comes to that. And so I've had one of the local companies, I-5 Glass, and they take their time. Same principle as the back glass. It's a gasket that goes around the glass, goes into place, and then it has to be drawn through to the seating point. This is a dual windshield with a split. So if you look at it, you got a right-hand windshield, left-hand windshield, and then you got a nose piece down the middle. Putting all that together and not breaking one of those pieces of glass with less than four days to have the car ready to go to SEMA, not my idea of fun. So I'm letting the guys from i5 Glass do it. The windshield gasket is exactly a replica of the one it started life with. Pound for pound identical. It's built off of the original one. Probably a little different rubber because things have changed in 50 years, but for the most part, that's exactly the product that it is. Typically speaking, the worst thing that can happen to a rubber gasket on one of these vehicles is it with age and with heat, they will begin to get brittle, they'll begin to crack, and they'll begin to lose their seal. That was one of the problems back in the day. It's still a real problem today. We had a company locally do the tint work on the side windows and the back glass, but the windshield itself is actually a dark factory tinted piece of glass. It's not the exact same tint as the side and the back, but what it will do is allow us to be able to see out of it still really well, but if you were standing back looking at it, it's gonna make the inside of that cab completely black. This is flat glass, so I had the guys over at I-5 cut me two pieces out of that really nice tent, and it's the same thickness, because it has to be the same thickness. If it's too thin, it'll wobble back and forth in the new gasket. If it's too thick, you'll never get the gasket and the glass in. So the windshield pieces are identical twins to what it would have started life with, except more tint. I've never actually done a split windshield style like this. I would think that second piece of glass would be much harder than the first piece. The first one has all the room and the latitude to move around. It can draw from the other side because there's no glass in it. But once that's seated, I think that the other side is gonna present more of a problem. I think that's where you really want the pros in there doing it. The paint is so beautiful on this truck, you wouldn't wanna take that chance. And that's why I have them doing it. There is always a chance you're gonna damage something, but the better the quality of the person doing it and the more knowledge and experience they have at doing something, the less chances of something going wrong, Murphy's Law. So with the gasket installed and the windshield setting where it's supposed to, they can put the lock strip in it. The lock strip is what keeps it from being able to compress and slide back out again later. So that's done, that looks absolutely gorgeous. That's a huge thing to have out of our way. Because with that out of our way, we really just have a few things left and we can load that thing on the truck and head off to the show. So this is the best part of the build is when you're down to just a small punch list. You walk the car from front to back, inside out, upside down. You make notes for all the little things that need to be done. It's usually something that you didn't do at the time because you knew you'd do at the end and you had bigger fish to fry. Well, there's no more fish left to fry. So installing the rearview mirror, the wipers, installing the visors, installing the last few things on this car, they're really kind of the cherry on the top of the sundae and that's what's gonna finish it off. So 
So firing up the uh, Mopar Performance Ray Barton 923 horsepower Hemi, I thought I'd have a little fun. I'm gonna have Will standing by the pipes when we do it. It's gotta, it's gotta be good for a laugh, right? I mean, I don't wanna give the guy a heart attack, but at the same time, if I had to die, I would rather die from a heart attack from an exhaust system than I would cancer in a hospital. So gotta look at it the bright side. Looking out for your brother. Will, if it's gonna leak, it's yes. gonna be out these back bowls right here. Okay. So you might see it better from this side. Out okay. Well, I don't wanna, oh, this is dry. Yeah. This is a dry run. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are we ready? Ready. Okay, so just crank over, see what's happening. Jeez, after. Oh, was it ready for that? <laughs> <laughs> so Mark thought it would be funny to put me right by the exhaust when they went to fire it up. Our camera guys were in on it. Uh, they still have one coming. Uh, the whole crew, there's about five or six guys that got one coming this next season. Do you think it was funny? No, it's not funny. It hurts. It hurts your ears. Now. <laughs> Woo. That's one badass <laughs> right there. Boy, that thing just feels strong. Well, I'll tell you, I've had cars my whole life and I've fired up some Hemis around here. I've built engines that I thought were the nastiest things on the planet. Nothing. This is the wildest, for me, because I'm an OE guy. I know there's guys like Ron down at Magnum Force that deal with 10 million horsepower, jet engines, whatever. For me, this is absolutely the epitome. 923 horsepower on pump gas. So I can pull up to the local gas station and say, fill her up, which is only about five gallons. But still, 923 horsepower in a vehicle that probably weighs 3,000 pounds and all the weights over the back tires. Yeah, bring seam on. I am ready. I am ready for the red carpet and I'm ready to set the world on fire. And you just make sure you get my insurance paid up. Accidents. So Justin and I came down a day early, kind of go over the A100, make sure it was running, driving, ready to go. Got here early this morning, got right to the booth, and it wouldn't start. So after some trial and error, going through the whole thing, come to find out our fuel pump is no longer working. This pump is real? Yeah. It's real frustrating. Real disappointing.